hello guys. So I'd like to welcome you all to my first official stream. Um, so just regarding Vicky, your question of what time it is in Malta, it's actually at 1 a.m. And um, normally I wouldn't be up this late, ideally, but you know, since it's my first stream, I'd be a bit more anxious and everything. I wanted to make sure there would be minimal sound while doing the stream. So I said doing it at a later time would be optimal. Um, so in regards to the stream, what I'd like to do is, first I'd go over a couple of points, um, answer one Patreon question, and also then look at your own chat and answer some of the questions you guys ask me. Also, I'd like to give a quick shout out to Men of the West, because, yeah, like, before doing the stream, I was super, super anxious. And that's one of the reasons why I delayed making a stream so long, I guess. And um, he was always there when I needed some advice or, you know, just tips regarding streams or, you know, how, how, is, like, how to approach it or some points I might miss. And he's always, always there for help. He's also an incredible source of Tolkien knowledge and I'd highly encourage you guys to check out his channel. Also, quick shout out to my patrons whose continuous support has really helped to improve this channel between new equipment, hardware, software, and even, for example, I recently got um, an artist for some really cool merch, merch, merch designs. Um, they've really helped, and I think the, the quality in this channel has improved a lot thanks to them. So yeah, um, I'd like to, let's see, some questions. And yeah, of course, hello to everyone, and I'd love to hear where you guys are from at the moment. It's, I, I imagine many people would be from the US, considering the time. But if there's anyone else, even from Europe, it would be really cool to check out where you're all from. Oh cool, look, like Poland, Finland. I'm, I'm really surprised you guys are still awake, I'm glad. Hopefully next time, you know, I'll make it at a much better time to accommodate everyone. Um, oh yeah, just, I think it's good to also start from the Patreon question, which was, which character from Game of Thrones would fit best in the Lord of the Rings, and which Lord of the Rings character would have the best chance of surviving in Westeros? So I really like this question, it's a really cool contrast between the two worlds. And I think, if I had to put a Game of Thrones character that would fit well in the Lord of the Rings, I would probably go with Ned Stark, because he's got, you know, a very straightforward personality, the loyalty, the honor, he's good-natured, and I could see him fitting in as some Lord of Gondor. There are obviously quite a few complicated characters in Game of Thrones that could have a really cool impact in the world of Arda, but I feel the way they're written wouldn't really fit well in Tolkien's mythology. The, the writing styles are so different that... It just wouldn't work out. But while well, Ned Stark is that sort of character, I could see him fitting in. And now in regards the Lord of the Rings character that would fit in for in um, Game of Thrones, I would say, again, assuming it's just Lord of the Rings and not the Silmarillion, I would go with Denethor. Because out of all the characters yeah, in the Lord of the Rings, I think he's one of the most politically strategic ones. He, he weighs every move and decision he makes. So he would have an, an, actually, an actual good chance of surviving in the world of Game of Thrones. Realistically, I don't see him being like a big player in the world, but perhaps something like the lord of one of the old houses, which is admired by its neighboring factions, he would fit well as something like that. Um, let's see, so now I'm going to move on to some of your questions. Oh yeah, and again, like, it's really awesome to see where you're all from, you know, again, I'm seeing so many from Europe, Slovenia, UK, Switzerland, Germany, England, and obviously no US. I'm just, I really appreciate that you guys stayed up late to watch the stream. And I'm also surprised that my anxiety isn't peaking too much, because I was so, so scared of this. Um, so let's see. Just checking out questions. Sorry guys, I just really have to pick from where to start. Um, so I'm going to start with Mark 1138, whether Tom Bombadil was the very embodiment of nature. And this was actually something I discussed in my video on Tom Bombadil, and it was my favorite theory. But to summarize it, um, 
I feel the way he was the first one to go, the first, sorry, the first one to enter Arda, and the last one to go. How the ring didn't have any control over him, and um, even the, the, he was almost restricted, you know, to, to the old forest. I felt, yeah, he was a, quite a, a representation of Arda and its creation, the, the embodiment of the music of the Ainur. Um... Okay, now that's this is a really cool. Okay, so, and again, thank you, Vicky, and everyone. I really appreciate the kind words. It's, it's, and even Pluck, like Plakant Bringer, um, he's one of our mods on our Discord channel, and he's done such a, a superb job at moderating it for, for me on my behalf. Like, I'm super, super grateful for their help. So, um, regarding the question I was going to answer, Louis the Sun Kings on. Who my favorite character in Tolkien's writing is and why. Um, so now this is quite so quick sorry, quick shout out, thanks Dalton for the the super sub. I'm sorry, now regarding my favorite character. It's I would say it's actually quite complicated. Because you know, like when I was younger, my favorite was Legolas just because of you know the movies. He was super cool, <laughs> you know, there's no denying it. But then as I got older. I started to appreciate the more complicated characters. So before reading the Silmarillion, um, out of the Lord of the Rings, I would say my favorite character was Boromir. I liked the complexity of it, of him. But then after reading the Silmarillion, and I know it's quite a controversial choice, I would have to say my favorite character is Feanor, at least out of interest in the character, because he's so complicated. You have you know, okay, let's, let's say the typical elf. We all see them as peaceful, kind, you know, good-natured, wise. While Feanor is the most talented, or the most skillful elf, apart from perhaps Galadriel. And yet he goes against most of the, most of the, the normal image we have on, of elves, I guess. And um, even that stubborn nature, that he wouldn't fall for Morgoth's lies completely. He knew when Morgoth wanted the Silmarils, he saw past it, and he was so determined to reclaim them that he led all those elves into Middle-earth. Even, okay, he committed many atrocities, and there is no denying that there is a certain evil aspect to him. But I also appreciate how literally all, or not all, a vast majority of the events and victory, victories of the free people in Middle-earth occurred because of his decisions. That that choice, even if it was done with a very bad motive, is what gave the free people the opportunity to actually put up a good resistance against Morgoth. And um, yeah, so actually, he's my one. I'd say again, my favorite. And I was actually recently working on a video on his character, and I think I had around twenty pages of research, and I'm slowly, you know, summarizing them and trying to give a, an accurate portrayal of his story. Um, so let me see some other questions. So Marianne Hutchinson asks how I would feel if both Frodo and Gandalf got married and had kids. What the story would be like? Um, I, I can't see Gandalf getting married. I don't know, it seems a bit odd for a wizard. While in Frodo's case, assuming it was during the story, I think it would kind of harm the the way the plot moves on because um the whole idea of Frodo's self-sacrifice is a, is very you know it's, it's a powerful idea when when Frodo and Sam reach Mordor for example they know there is no turning back at that point for them you know it's they're walking to their death and they just want to try and succeed in their quest well if he had a family I imagine we'd have so many passages of him being conflicted of him I imagine feeling guilty, worrying, and I'd rather that's reserved for Sam, because for Sam it wasn't something he had already. It was something, you know, his his love for Rosie Cotton. It was a, a chance of a fulfillment which he chose to leave behind to help his master and you know Frodo along his quest, and he was crucial for it. So yeah, in Frodo's 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 case, if he was married before the quest, I think it wouldn't add much, while. If he got married after his quest was complete, I think um, 
we wouldn't really appreciate the impact it had on his character because it seems like everything went well while in Frodo's case there is something special not, not really special but iconic or significant that after he succeeded in his in his quest he was he rid himself from the burden of the one ring he was never fully healed and i really think that's an, an important mission in, in um, tolkien's works that sometimes people have to go through hard situations or tough situations which we won't emerge unscathed from and the best we can do is you know pull ourselves together and keep going keep pushing forward well if he had the family settled down and he never had to travel to the undying lands it would almost suggest that you know he's fully healed he got over it all and everything is okay which again is really great for frodo but i think it would detract from the enjoyment and depth of the actual works Um, so I'm going to read, so in, in Raji X asked, who do you think would have the most chances to defeat a Maiar? So Eru, Luvatar, and Golian, Shilov, but another Maiar and Valar don't count. Um, that's, that's actually a really hard question. Hmm. So technically we know of Fingolfin, who, you know, rode out and he had a duel with Morgoth. And they, they actually, this was quite a close battle. So I imagine there are actually not mortals, but um, beings that are not Maiar spirits or Valar, and they have a chance of beating one, of defeating one. Though then again, Maiar are immortal and they can be reincarnated. So I would say one of the most... No, actually, no, it's, it's worth mentioning that there were some orc chieftains that um, were Maiar spirits, the, the, the least Maiar spirits that served Morgoth. Some of them became orc, became, no, they were re but no, they were given form as orcs. They took the form of orcs. And these were slain by the free people. So yeah, so for sure the free people are capable of defeating the Maiar. So I would say, yeah, some, some powerful elf, Fingolfin, one of those guys. Uh, so Anonymous asked, do you guys actually play the medieval to Total War, Third Age, Divide and Conquer mod? Um, I, I tried it out. It's a very cool mod. If, if anyone is really into Lord of the Rings and they want a really nice strategy game, I would recommend trying out that mod. Though I actually I don't use that one. I use, I think it's called The Rise of Mordor and it's for Attila Total War. And I use some of its footage in my videos, for example, Helm's Deep. So if you've seen my videos and you enjoyed it, again, try it out. Very, very good mod with a really dedicated team um, in regards to making canon material for the Lord of the Rings. Um, so, sorry, Jay, I missed the super chat. Thanks for the donation. Um, <laughs> I'm seeing all the questions pile up and I'm like, oh no, should I, should I hurry up? Am I going to slow too much detail? Um... So in, in regards to Yin Yang, would, he's asking me, would I consider doing Game of Thrones content alongside the Lord of the Rings? So I like Game of Thrones. I read the books, but um, I'm not as passionate about it as the Lord of the Rings. And I also feel the level of like, OK, so one of the things I enjoy most or actually the videos I enjoy doing the most in the Lord of the Rings are usually the ones with, with some not, not really a complicated mystery, but I'd find some weird connections while doing research and I come to appreciate something that I never noticed before in Tolkien's works. So for example, let's say my video on the Silent Watchers, the link to how they might have been possessed by elven spirits that might have remained in Middle Earth by refusing the call of the Valar. And these are certain connections which I only truly appreciated after doing a lot of research and trying to bridge everything. And I don't feel there's enough work in, Lord, in the Game of Thrones so far to be able to do that. What I have actually considered is exploring other stories, but there would be more, for example, Hollow Knight, which is a really cool game with a, with a complicated story, and I feel I could do, do it justice. It's really interesting. Well, I'm also very into, for example, Game of Thrones, not, not Game of Thrones, sorry, Dark Souls lore, but there, there are incredible creators already. Like, there's one guy, Vati Vidya, that had actually inspired me to create this channel. 
and I, I don't think I could do a, a job as good as his, so there wouldn't be much of a point in doing that. Um, so Max Mercer asked, why were the Istari so powerless compared to Sauron? Um, so after S Sauron and the My some other Maya spirits had traveled to Middle Earth, I think the Valar learned that, um, no, even after the destruction of the War of Rat, which was catastrophic for the world of Arda, you know, the whole continent of Beleriand sank. I think the Valar learned there wasn't, they shouldn't try and impress the free people with power or strength. They shouldn't lead through domination, but through wisdom. Through wisdom by rallying the free people, uniting them, helping them see the right direction. And that was the whole point of the story, to go as wise old men that seemed frail and weak, yet they could offer enough insight and help to the free people to guide them to fight against Sauron. Uh, they still weren't powerless, you know, Saruman, if he got the ring, he probably could have been quite a threat to Sauron. And um, in Gandalf's case, after he was sent back as Gandalf the White, Luvatar had actually lifted the, some, some, you know, like, in extremes, not extreme, in very difficult situations, Gandalf could use his true angelic power because the limit was lifted by a rule of Vitar after he was re-embodied. Re and we actually see him use this power when he wards off the Nazgul using his that white light, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, I wouldn't say they were powerless. In their true forms, they were actually probably not as powerful as Sauron, but very formidable beings. Uh... So let's see. Just checking some questions. Oh, sorry, so Jacob, regarding my video output. Um, so at the moment, I've been working on quite a few projects. I've been a lot on discussing, you know, with my artists regarding merch. I've also been busy with a few studies. And my videos, I don't want to rush them. And there's so much research that's, that goes into them, like... I usually go through, and, and usually like, the more time that has passed since the start of this channel, my research has become a lot more detailed. Like I'm going through all the, you know, the main books, The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, The Cimmerian, The Unfinished Tales. Um, and then you have the history of Middle-earth, particularly um, the people of Middle-earth. Morgoth's Ring is an amazing read. The Letters of Tolkien. So I go through all this material to wrap it up and try and make as many connections and the best narrative possible. So yeah, so if my videos are slow, it's really most of my free time is dedicated to this channel. And at the moment, I'd be a bit busy with other things. And I also have no intention of lowering, you know, the quality standard <laughs> that I'd want to put out, especially because it's still such a crazy experience, you know, seeing how far this channel has come, even saying, okay, you know, I have 129,000 subscribers which for multi's person it's it's a lot you know it's um, i think one quarter of our population you know so it's it's still an incredible journey it's so i'm so grateful for for it all i don't want i don't want to, i don't want to see it as a business or some sort of uh, minimum you know minimum quota i just want to try and deliver the best quality for a community that deserves it so um Ray Phillips asked, if you could be from one kingdom in Middle Earth, which one would it be? Um, so if you asked before a, fac a faction, probably I think the Rangers were cool, but um, I think they're, they're cool from an external perspective. After you live their life, you know, it's probably quite, quite stressful and it's not the most pleasant experience. And again, as cool as it would be fighting and all that, a peaceful life would probably be ideal. I also don't think I'd want to be an elf because of, you know, the idea of eternity that they slowly lose their form. You know, it ends up almost an not an anxious but a troubling experience to remain in Arda in Arda without traveling to the Undying Lands. So I would say I would choose to be from the Kingdom of Gondor and perhaps part of, um, you know, maybe the household of Prince Imrahil, since they were like, they still retained the Numenorean heritage. And, 
you know, they were still part of the kingdom of Gondor, so I'd probably choose to be one of those guys. So regarding, so Vicky's question, can Meyer have children? Uh, yeah, um, we actually know of, of Melian, who was Thingol's wife, and they had, a, you know, from their bloodline, they had um, Luthien, and eventually, you know, Arwen, is tech, Arwen and Aragorn are both related to them, you know, distantly. But yeah, they can have children. Uh, why was so? So Meet Whiplash asked, why was Saruman so weakened at the end after his stabbing? So, oh yeah, so why so why couldn't he regain enough strength after his stabbing? Hmm. Um, that's actually a really good question, and I'm trying to think. Actually, you know, it's it's actually something interesting which I never thought about. Because he never really put his power into anything, Sar as far as we know. At least Saruman did not put his power in anything similar to, to Sauron. Um, perhaps it was something to do with their diminished strength, strength, since they were, they had that initial limit that I mentioned previously. You know, which was a power limit. Perhaps after he died, since he did not return to, you know, the the Undying Lands. He might have remained in, in that diminished power form. While if he was reborn in the Undying Lands, he would be able to regain it all. I think that would be my, my best answer for it. Uh, again, thanks guys for all the, the, the kind words. I really appreciate it. So yeah, th and yeah this is actually my first live stream. Giorgio sits. <laughs> It's going actually quite better than I thought. I was so, so stressed. Um, so Uncle Joe asked, Do you like Turin? Ha Turin hates him, feel sorry for him. Or, I, no, sorry. Do you like Turin? Hates him, feel sorry for him. I think he was kind of broken, but he was a great vehicle for exploring the land and people. Um, I think... I, I can't see why I would hate Turin, you know? It's almost... He didn't do anything particularly wrong. It was more of a, an unfortunate fate that seemed to follow him. So I would say, yeah, I'd feel sorry for him. It's just a, an unlucky story and he was, he's one of the more noble, not noble, one of the characters of the race of men who achieved the most. Uh, guys, I'm going to have to scroll down, I think, to, to the bottom of the comments because I'm really behind in time. So if there's anything you'd like to repeat, they just resend it and I'll check it out. Also, thanks the Nexus for the super sub. Well, I can't. I was like, like ten minutes behind, guys. I'm sorry. Um, and also five again. Thanks, Dalton. I really, really appreciate the subs. So, so Laperia asks, do you know how long the journey took for Frodo to destroy the ring, from le leaving Rivendell to the destruction of the One Ring? So I don't know by heart how much it was. I believe it was close to a year, though. It wasn't more than a year. Um, Nate asked, what do you think happened to Radagast after the war? Um, so if I remember correctly, it's mentioned that they couldn't find him in Rosgobel, which was his home in Mirkwood. And some people speculate that something might have slain him or that he was killed, but I, I don't really think that's possible. I think it's more likely that he was off on summer and, you know, nature was suffering during that time also. And, um... It's interesting, to, you know, whether he returned to the Undying Lands or remained in Middle-earth. Though either way, I think he would have been happy. I think at that point, he grew so accustomed to the land of, of Middle-earth and to its creatures, and he bonded so much with it, with them, sorry, that it wouldn't seem like a punishment. Or, you know, while, you know, Saruman was doomed, basically, and even the Blue Wizards kind of failed. So yeah, I think he probably remained in, in Middle-earth and just doing his thing with nature. Um, again, guys, I'm sorry if I missed some questions. It's just I really want to try and keep up with the latest times. Uh, so Mirvod asked whether I'm hyped for the Amazon series. So realistically, for me, any Lord of the Rings content is amazing. I'd rather have more content than not. And I, th I think overall, you know, it's it's a big game changer for Amazon. It's their first big series. They spend so much and they're trying to get into the industry. So they have to succeed. It's not a matter of 
you know, with some, a cash grab, in my opinion. I think they actually want to deliver something phenomenal. So yeah, I'm quite confident in it, and I'm looking forward to it. And I actually would wish that maybe people are a bit less harsh and less skeptical. And, we, you know, we give them a chance. If they mess up, we can be as critical as we want. But if we start creating this idea that it's bound to fail, it's almost certainly going to seem that way. You know, we're creating a bias. Um, thanks, Vicky, for the super sub. Um, let me see your question. So can you talk about Gandalf and how sub subtle he is about his use of magic? It seems like he rarely uses it, but he's so subtle that one doesn't notice it. One doesn't notice that he's using it. Um, I think... So... In the world of Varda, I don't think there's really a hard magic system. You know, you don't really have battlefields where everyone's shooting spells at each other. Not even in the Silmarillion. You know, we'd never see Morgoth summon some ma massive firestorm or anything. So I think that's more related to the soft magic system of Middle-earth. That it's more of a subtle magic. Even, you know, the greater and more powerful beings. Their, their magic is more subtle. We can see it in... The, the rings of power in, um, you know, Morgoth slowly dividing his his power between his his creatures and empowering them, you know, making them stronger than they were. It's, it's, it's more of a subtle magic. And in Gandalf's case, I would say most of it was, you know, in his use of fire. In, there's also kind of magic, you can say, when he removed the spell that, or, or not really the spell, there was, I think, again, and this actually happens to be ne what, I'm, what I'll be discussing in next week's video, because I was going to discuss Grima Wormtongue. And, but there seemed to be like some sort of spell on Theoden, and he manages to lift it, you know, using his power. Though I think probably the most, again, now this is all, you know, the top of my head, and I'm sure I'm missing some iconic parts from the books, but... Um, the most powerful magic we see Gandalf use was probably... Use was probably um, when he warded off the Nazgul using his light after Farmer and the Gondor reinforcements returned to Gondor. Wow, Dalton, that's thanks a lot, dude. I really appreciate the super sub, man. Um, so regarding Jacob Ferdinand Jenner, were the Noldor involved in the War of the Ring? Um, so at that point, the remnants of the Noldor were you know, there was the main area, you know, in the land of Rivendell, with Elrond. And you also had a few with, including, you know, Galadriel. So, I don't, I, th I think the main, um, they had a more subtle effect, you know, it wasn't battles. It was more, you know, you had in Rivendell, where they gave, you know, the advice, the Council of Elrond, and the real, I guess, battle that they took part in would probably be, probably be when... Galadriel and the elves of Lothlorien attacked Dol Guldur and Mirkwood, and she threw down their walls, the walls of Dol Guldur, and, you know, the, the Mirkwood was cleansed after. So I would say that was their biggest involvement. Um, so Mirvold asked, what do you think about the other continents in Arda? So I would say most of them, you know, they're, they're quite normal and but there is one actual content which i was really fascinated with and i would love to learn more about and there was i think it was the the dark continent or i think the darks or the dark lands and it was to the south of middle earth and we don't really know anything about it or you know very little but it, it would be really cool to delve in deeper to speculate you know what, what was its point you know were there men were there children of Iluvatar that are there there you know I imagine they never really experienced Morgoth's influence. It would be really cool to to explore. I'd like to look, you know, in further detail throughout Tolkien's works. Maybe I can find more info on it. Um, so Enragx asked, "Who do you think was the wisest? No, who do you think was the wisest mortal?" I'm not talking about the Starry or Elves. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going through all of them in my head at the moment, trying to. Okay, so. Who was who was there during the third age? Hmm. So okay, let's say during during the War of the Ring. Um 
one of the wiser mortals, at least the ones we know, would probably probably be Aragorn. Um, even far, and uh, so like Denethor was wise, but he had you know a lot of shortcomings when it comes to his own bias. He was wise in his own way. He had his own capabilities, but I wouldn't say it was a universal wisdom. Well, I would say his son Faramir had that in abundance. You know, it's he was um, he was. He had all the good traits of his father without the bad ones. So I would say it's Aragorn and second, you know, from the characters we know, would probably be Faramir. Sorry, guys, if I'm not keeping up, I'm really, I'm really trying. Um, so David Gregor asked, how are the ring rates so powerful when they don't even have the rings? Um... So the ring greats weren't powerful in the sense of a physical power. Their power lay in, in fear and terror. And I think that was more... It, it, it didn't depend on the ring. It was more in the form that they had, you know, their final form. That after all that year, all, those, all that time, sorry, their form slowly shifted to the unseen world. And they had become a symbol of terror. And that was where I think their power lay. That... Against foes that didn't fear them, such as Gandalf and Glorfindel, they were much less powerful. So the rings didn't play such a big part, I think, in their power at that point. Um, let me see. So Sandman Hyder asked me, what is your favorite, sorry, what is your favorite Lord of the Rings book edition of all time? So I, I think you, by that you're asking me which of which Lord of the Rings book is my favorite one, and um, so now so I'm trying to remove you know the film bias because for example, out of all the films, I think the the Two Towers was my favorite one. The Battle of Helm's Deep is by far the coolest battle in the trilogy. But in the books, it's, it's not really des described in it's 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 described in a different way that. I wouldn't appreciate it as much as, you know, that cinematic experience. So removing that bias, I would probably say the Silmarillion after I get to appreciate the story, after actually, you know, reading it four times and seeing how everything is connected, you know, seeing this whole entire age, these whole family, these timelines, the, the family lines just continuing, each one facing their own hurdles, which, you know, it's, it's it's amazing how it's all interconnected. It's like a you know a domino effect, which with each part leading up you know to two more. It's just super. It's an it's an amazing book. It's just yet yeah, it's, it's it's brutal to read because of you know it's complex. It's it's such a heavy read that the first time I read it, I I remember I had the one story which had struck out stand, stood out. Sorry, was um, Turin and his black sword Gurtang. That was the one which I was memorable. You know, for me, I think I read it when. I was 13 or 14. But then after, you know, reading it, what, two, three more times, you really start to appreciate everything. It's, it's, it's an amazing book. And I'd really encourage everyone who actually gave up, you know, first time reading it, it might be heavy, but it's really, really worth it. What I would actually encourage, though, which, which would help a lot, and I, I had actually advised some parts of our community about it, and the feedback was that it helped. So I imagine it's useful. So while you're reading the Silmarillion, you can find some online guides, which are really helpful to give you a quick summary of what you read in the past chapters, what information might be important, you know, so you don't get mixed up between, you know, who's Fingolf and who's Fingon, who's Turgon, Tingol, Mitros, you know? And it really helps to keep you on track. And also if you write a couple of notes, you know, while you're going, who's who, just major events, you know, like, hey, Fingolfin was the, the elf that led his people across the Helkaraxe. He died in the Battle of the Sudden Flame. And then his son was Fingon. You know, it's like, keep that continuous, like, create a timeline for yourself to keep some notes. Um, so let me... I noticed there was... Loremaster had left a question. Yeah. Because he actually had said that he had a good, a good question for him, and I was really curious what it's going to be. So he asked, why didn't Sauron destroy Mount Doom if he knew it was the only way to destroy the One Ring? 
other than, of course, knowing that most people wouldn't be able to destroy it. So I think it's there's a two two parts to this to this answer. Um, so first of all, we know that Sauron thought it was almost impossible. Not al not almost. He thought it was impossible for someone to destroy the ring to to gather that willpower to travel to enter his fortress. His his entrances were so well defended that the success from the quest of the ring was almost you know like a series of lucky events, if you want to call it that. But it was actually, I would say, more fate. So yeah, he was um, overconfident. He thought there was no chance they would ever manage to get there. No one would ever want to, destroy, want to destroy the ring. You know, Gandalf actually says that the, the chance that they would want to destroy the one ring didn't even enter his darkest dream. So yeah, he was completely overconfident. And the other answer to this question was... Um, Sauron actually used the forges of Mount Doom to weave his spells and for his magic. And I think these weren't just like one-off spells or, you know, its purpose was actually used quite often. Because in the books we're told that orcs would actually re repair the passageway to Mount Doom, the passageway from Barad-dûr to Mount Doom, quite often. And it was quite seamless, which I think would suggest that Sauron would emerge from Barad-dûr, walk to Mount Doom, and use it for whatever magic he needed. So it still served a purpose, and he didn't see any threat, you know, to his reign from it. Um, so, I'm not going to really answer this for now, but Bringarn, Bringarn asked me, what do you think about the Hobbit movies? And I, I have so many thoughts and conflicting opinions, or... Things I like, things I didn't like, and I actually hope to create a series soon where I break it up in small bits. What went well, what could have done, been done better, and how I would have changed things. And I'm really excited to work on it. It's like something, it's a project I've been, I've been planning way ahead. And I, I think it's quite close to fulfillment. So, you know, you'll see in maybe a couple of months, but it's going to be a series of videos. And I'm really, really excited to get on it, to work on it. Um, let's see, I'm going to scroll down again, guys, just to, to keep, oh yeah, sorry, there were a couple of questions where I'm from, um, so I'm from Walter, and I, I'm sorry for the funny accent, guys, I, I do try my best, um, so let's see. So... Enraji asked, what was the strongest race of men in the, in the Third Age? I think it would be the Haradrim, since described... Okay, so he said that he thinks they're the Haradrim, since they were described as half-trolls in the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. So first I'd like to clear the misconception regarding the Haradrim. When they were described as half-trolls, it was from the perspective of the Rohirrim that they never saw them, they never saw these people before. I think it referred to their size, their you know, there, there might have been bigger, stronger. You know, it, it was just like um, a perspective, but they weren't really half trolls or mixed with trolls in any way. So I would say the strongest race of men, assuming it's not regard to, you know, having lots of men or, or the strength of a force, but... Mm, okay, let me answer both, sorry. So the strongest faction of men... Because we have no idea on, on the Easterlings or Haradrim. So it's, it's a really tough question. I don't know the limits of their force. But from what we know, I would still say it's Gondor. That without, you know, Sauron's orcs, the Haradrim and the Easterlings, I don't think they would have been able to overcome the faction of Gondor, even though it was in the twilight of its strength. So I would say, yeah, Gondor was still strongest. Um, yeah, Max, Malta, we don't have... No, no, we, we we do have a winter, but it's 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 a very unpleasant winter. It's like really humid, but our summers are also I don't know. It's our weather is strange. You know, it's like either super hot or super cold, and we have like three weeks where it's nice weather, at least for Maltese people, I think, because then foreigners love our heat. But yeah, for me, um, especially since while I'm recording, the heat it plays a part in summer. It's way more stressful. I take longer and. I'm looking forward to winter to make recording so much easier. Um, 
So Emperor asked, Hey Gigzon, what would have happened if Sauron was not the villain, villain in the Third Age? But what if Morgoth... But what if Morgoth created the rings and ruled the Nine instead of him? Um, so this is a vid this is actually something, or it's actually part of something I wanted to discuss in its own video, um, because it's quite complicated and controversial. So, so bear with me. Um, so according to Tolkien, during the Third Age, Sauron's power was not during the. Okay, let's say Sauron's power at its peak was stronger than Morgoth's towards the end, because Morgoth had divided his power throughout all his forces, and he had weakened himself. And because of this division of power, it's why he was eventually overcome in the War of Wrath. While in Sauron's case, he put a good chunk of his power in the One Ring, but it was an object which was in his possession, and rather than weakening his power, it actually augmented it, and he was, it was stronger in his possession than you know, his previous power level. So I think if there was Morgoth instead of Sauron, he would probably have been an easier threat to the free people, as controversial as it sounds. And I also think Morgoth was less wise than Sauron. He was more... No, hmm. Actually, okay, so with Morgoth then, he wouldn't have held back, I think. So it actually might have led to further destruction of the free people, because he was... Rather than more loot ruthless, his objective was almost the complete destruction of Arda. While in Sauron's case, he didn't want to rule a world which was destroyed. He felt that he could still... It w he wanted to rule a world which was under his dominion, even if it was really twisted and horrible. But it was his dom he still wanted to rule. He wanted things done in his fashion. While in Morgoth's case, it was more yeah, total destruction. So if we assume Sauron had an a strong enough force to conquer Arda, by then, in Morgoth's hands, it would have been worse for the free people. But if not, he would have been an easier foe. Uh, sorry guys, again, if this is all over the place, it's just, you know, I'm thinking <laughs> as I go. So, yeah. Um, let me... So, Nate asked, Nate Chamberlain Marks asked me, do you have a favorite dwarf? Hmm. So, um... I would say my favorite dwarf, I would have two. My favorite one in The Lord of the Rings would probably be Dane Ironfoot. He's got, you know, that toughness of the dwarven people, that, you know, the resilience. Even towards the end of his life, when he was super old, he was still fighting besides um, Brand. And um, he's just an awesome dwarf. He's, he's got all the good things of the dwarves without, and, and with more wisdom than the typical dwarven leader, I would say. While in the Silmarillion, there is that really cool dwarven lord that had injured Glaurung. I can't remember his name. I think it was Asgul, but I have to check on it. Uh, I'm going to scroll down again, guys. Let me see. So Enragix asked, what do you think of the Shadow of War games? So I think... These were, again, I wanted to cover them in my in their own video. Um, so they are super games. They have a really cool direction. They're really fun. And I would say gameplay-wise, they peaked in Lord of the Rings terms. And um, they have, you know, lore. They made a mess of the lore, which I accept. Like, I accept, like, hey, they made a mistake. Not that I think it's a good thing. And I wish they had some, you know, information about the correct lore included in the game to make sure people don't get confused. However, at the same time, I think that freedom they had to bend the lore a bit allowed them to create a new sort of story rather than, you know, recycling things. So, so it was, it had its good and bad side. I just wish maybe they tread a bit more carefully on some you know some of the issues but they're super super games i think i enjoy them personally i'd really recommend them just yeah make sure you make sure you learn the correct lore let's let's not get confused um let's see mark anthony said just say you love boromir and i'll subscribe mark i adore boromir dude he's an amazing amazing character 
Let's see now. Hmm. Um, so, yo, yeah, new, so Nuka mentioned the Golem game they mentioned. Sorry, Nuka, men, Nuka mentioned the Golem game they announced. Um, I actually looked into it. The trailer didn't show much, and I actually mentioned it in a separate video. But I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward, I guess. We'll see where it goes. It's a very weird concept, a stealth game. With Golem, it can work, it might not, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Um, also, guys, I just wanted to mention, um, make sure you check out some of our fellow Lord of the Rings YouTube channels, because I think something which I really appreciate is being part of this community. We have so many dedicated and talented creators. With... A very good comrader camaraderie, you know, it's everyone helps each other. We have a Discord channel where we, we, we just discuss, you know, it's friendly. It's it's a, a very good-natured community and it's wonderful, I think. So, yeah, if you can check out, you know, the Men of the West, the History of Middle-Earth, Lore of the Rings, Nerd of the Rings, um, the Philosopher, the Philosopher's Games. Um, I don't know. If, yeah, but basically go on my channel, check on go on the homepage and there's like fellow Lord of the Rings channels. Just check them out. Amazing content and really, really nice guys. Can't recommend them more. They're really, really nice. Um, so, Joseph Bloggs asked, what is the best Lord of the Rings game and why is it the Battle for Middle-earth 2? Joseph, you, you're a wise guy, dude. The Battle for Middle-earth 2 is... I would say now we can say it's officially the best Lord of the Rings game. And I would actually, I actually want to stream it in, in the future. It would be really cool, I think. And even organize a couple of tournaments in our own community. Um, Jacob asked, why were the Gondorian soldiers so weak and untrained while fighting the orcs at the Pelennor fields? I would say that's only in, in the movies. In the books, they were fine. They... They weren't at the peak of their of their strength. You know, they had probably leadership issues by then. You know, Gondor was waning. The population was dwindling. They had gone through many hurdles to the civil war, the Great Plague. They were a fading population. But I would say the the individual stories, the individual sorry, the individual soldiers were still well trained and strong. They they were portrayed really pathetic in, in the movies. You know, like always getting dominated by the orcs, but I, I think they, that was just the direction to, so, to show how dire the situation was. But in fact, they were probably great, you know, stronger than the average orc. Um, so it's Showtime asked, do you think Sauron would fear Bombadil, Tom Bombadil? I don't, I don't think Sauron would have really given him much thought. Tom Bombadil seemed to be his own entity. He did his own thing. He didn't really fight against, you know, the enemies of the free people. So if anything, I think Sauron, rather than fear him, he would actually underestimate him and not truly appreciate, you know, who Tom Bombadil was. So, yeah, I don't think he would fear him. I think he'd just ignore him and eventually, as Gandalf said, if Sauron had conquered everything, Tom Bombadil would be the last to fall. But he would eventually. Um, so let's see. Sorry, guys, I'm, I'm trying to, to scroll through. Also, um, regarding, I, I know it's, I might sound a bit anxious in this live stream. It's, it is it's quite an anxious anxious stressful experience you know it's like you're you're more aware that hey what you're saying it's it's i would hopefully you know in the future they improve but again i'm really surprised with the way it's going i expected my voice to break so much and to make so many mistakes so yeah i think it's going well but hopefully in the future it'll be better um so duke jackson asked what did tolkien mean by the term dark elf so by Dark Elf, they were the elves that had, again, if I remember correctly, they're the elves that hadn't traveled to 
the undying lands to um, um, the continent of Amman, and they didn't see the light of the two trees. So since they didn't see the light, they were referred to the Dark Elves, and these were the ones that remained in Middle-earth. So um, Tranduil's people would technically be Dark Elves. So um, let's see. Let's go through. Uh, so yeah, oh yeah, this is a good one. So the Mirko Del Fast name, whether I like the movies. Um, so again, the Lord of the Rings ones were amazing. And I would wonder how much of a bias I have because I watched them when I was a kid. Like, I remember them so um, iconically. And I, I was quite young. Like, I think I probably was 13 when I, when, I first, when I watched The Return of the King in the cinema. Which is, again, it was, it was quite, quite a scary experience for a 13-year-old. I remember the, the Army of the Dead had really freaked me out. She loved not, not much in a weird way, but, you know, it, it was a memorable experience. And I had no idea what was happening at that age. You know, it was like... Hey, it's a cool movie. There's this battles. There's this this great quest. Let's check it out. And I I also remember I had a really weird bias from my uncle. My first experience with the Lord of the Rings was through my uncle. He used to read the books to me again when I was six or seven. But he I used to ask some really dumb questions or you know haphazard ones, and I had this weird understanding that there was two wizards, Gandalf and. Saruman, and the whole concept of the book was who gets the most rings, who wants to be the Lord of the Rings, you know, literally, that, hey, these two wizards, these two factions, and everyone's fighting for a bunch of rings. Luckily, when I actually, you know, watched the movies and read the books, <laughs> this concept was erased. But yeah, so regarding the movies, the main Lord of the Rings trilogy are a magnific magnificent work of art, which hopefully will become immortalized. I hope that, you know, in 30 years, people are saying, hey, Lord of the Rings, classic, let's check them out. The Hobbit had their good parts, but I think, you know, there were some shortcomings. I wouldn't say they reached, you know, legend tier of Lord of the Rings. I enjoyed watching them once, you know, once, twice, but they wouldn't be the type of film I'd really be super keen on rewatching. You know, maybe like once a year, but not like, you know, Lord of the Rings, I can watch it any time and we're totally fine. I'm down with it. Let's do it. I was actually, regarding this, I thought it would be a really cool and fun idea. And I, want, I wanted to talk to some of the, my fellow Lord of the Rings YouTube creators so that we organize an official Lord of the Rings marathon day that everyone starts watching the trilogy. At the same time, we can have like a cool hashtag on Twitter. So... You know, we're all at the same point in the story and you can get this really cool, not really, you know, like, imagine we reach one of the top hashtags of Lord of the Rings movies or something, you know, spread awareness for the movies. It's, it's just an amazing experience. I really hope we talk we dis to discuss it with them and, you know, we can work on it. Um, so, let's see. Sorry for these pauses, guys. I'm just, you know, going through the comments. So I'm gonna I'm gonna mess up your name, sorry. So EQ Buted asked me, do you think that the Silmarils played any part during the Third Age? Um so to be fair, the history of Arda is a domino effect from the creation of the Silmarils. Everything that happened, or a good chunk of what happened, was, you know, a, a butterfly effect. So I would say, indirectly, they played a part. And I actually mentioned it in my last video regarding the file of Galadriel. The file contained the light of, this, of the Silmaril, um, you know, the light of Arendil, which Frodo used quite often, not quite often, you know, at significant parts during their quest, and it actually helped them get through big obstacles, you know, the Silent Watchers, Shelob. It stopped Frodo, you know, from um, trying to use the One Ring when the Witch King called out to it outside of Minas Morgul. So they still played a part, for sure. Um. 
So, so Marty Robbins asked, who was the best tactician in the Lord of the Rings? Hmm. Again, so we're quite limited to what people did and, you know, their key. Okay, let's say, if it's not a ruler, probably Gandalf. He managed to unite so many of the free people, you know, each one had their own agenda, their own direction that he had to follow. They all called him by their own name. He had such an, an influence in organizing them, rallying them, that I would say he was the best stra stra strategic genius in the Lord of the Rings. I also think Sauron is worth mentioning, even though, you know, there was the mistake in allowing the One Ring to be destroyed and entering his realm. But he understood, you know, that with attrition, Gondor would fall. He had quite a good plan on how he, could co how he would conquer Middle-earth. He even, you know, when he, when he stayed hiding as the, the necromancer, lying low, confusing them. So I would say Sauron was also an incredible strategic guy, more than his master Morgoth. Um, let's see. So Brian Darcy asked, what do you feel about the religious aspect from the Lord of the Rings, and especially the Silmarillion? So, I think by that you'd be referring to Tolkien's own religion in the Silmarillion. You know, sorry, when he used you know, his own religious beliefs and integrated them in the story. So, I think, you know, it's, it's fine. It's, it's an okay thing to do. And um, there are so many crucial points in the story which, which make a massive difference, you know, to the, to the whole timeline. The, the creation of the One Ring, the way... You know, Morgoth was kind of a fallen angel, and this, it, it, you know, it's it's the backbone of the mythology, and um, people can appreciate it for what it is. You know, it's a, it's an amazing story. It's it's Tolkien managed to create such a massive universe around that backbone that, yeah, I think it works out perfectly. Um. So James asked whether they have the favorite character. I actually answered this earlier in the, in the live stream, so I won't answer it again. But in short, it's Feanor for the Cimmerian and Boromir for the Lord of the Rings. Um, hmm. So. Enra so, Enragix, you have really cool questions. I like them. So, um... He asked me, do you think that the Balrog, like Durin's Bane, would defeat Sauron? And what are your top three favorite creatures and beings? So I don't think the Balrog would have any chance against Sauron. You know, Gandalf defeated the Balrog, and Gandalf's power was severely limited. So in that case, I think, hands down, Sauron would win. Regarding my top three creatures and beings... Um, hmm, so I like... I like I'm quite um, affectionate towards the ends because, you know, I, I love I love nature. I think it's something people don't appreciate as much, and we should be doing so much more effort in preserving what we have. And the ends is such a beautiful metaphor, especially nowadays. It's almost you know, Tolkien saw you know the the, the effects of the industrial revolution. He saw nature, you know, making way for yeah, industrialization, and it's even more. Not potent, but it plays a bigger part nowadays that we care too much about building of gains, you know, money, 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 and nature is important. You know, I like the idea of the ants. It's it's so sweet. It's so yeah, I'm, I'm biased. So ants for sure. Second favorite creatures would be hmm. I think okay, let's include people. I would say then it's the dwarfs and finally men. Um so Case in Richmond asked, is Morgoth pure evil? I don't think he is pure. Mm. I, it's complicated because the thing is then it's slightly theological and it's more ph theological, philosophical, and it's quite complicated. Because if we believe that um, Eru Luvatar created Morgoth, then there must be some element of good in it. I believe that it's like a really complicated th philosophical, theological discussion. 
this would be really cool to cover in a video. Do I want to give it more thought? I'd rather say, hey, it needs more time and more research. I'd want to see even some more of Tolkien's own desc descriptions on, on more God. You know, he started off good after all. Yeah, so there has to be an element of good, you know. But if he was pure evil at the end, that's quite interesting. Do I'd like to see what Tolkien says? I'll, I'll, it'll be a really cool video. I guarantee we'll cover it. Um, so, Mark1138 asked, was there really an answer to where the Ant Wives went? We don't have a clear answer, you know, for where they went, but, you know, some people think they were destroyed after Sauron's forces, you know, destroyed the dark, sorry, the brown lands, or they might have gone to the Shire. I think... They were probably lost. I think eventually it was the fate of the ants that they would be reunited with the ant wives towards the end after in the undying lands, for example, but not before, or whatever awaited them beyond the spheres of Arda. Um so Bringarn asked me regarding my my memberships on this channel, which is actually something I've given a lot of thought to. So far I feel I'd I'd rather postpone channel membership. It's something I want to, to use once I create merch, because I feel it's something w which is relevant, you know, maybe a discount on merch with with mem channel membership, but adding it now, you know, it's it's like Patreon, but I, I feel, you know, I, I just appreciate what I have. I appreciate the community we've built. It's, it's an amazing experience. There is, I don't really, not care exactly, you know, but the, the monetary aspect of this channel is more, it allows me to dedicate more free time to this channel, you know, to grow it, to say, hey, it's safe to dedicate, you know, a couple of more hours, you know, an extra day to it, take some time off for it. But I'd rather create membership once I have my merch out, you know, when I get to creating more custom emojis and, I, you know, I'll give a, a good product for that first. Um, so, let's see. Guys, let me just check how much time has passed because I have no idea how long I've been talking. I just have to figure it out. Oh, okay, it's an hour. Okay, that's that's really impressive. I was so sure, like, after 30 minutes, I thought I'd be dying. But hey, one, we were amazing. Okay, we can do some more. Um, so Emperor John asked me, do you think they should have kept the fight in between Sauron and Aragorn at the Black Gate in the Return of the King? Um... So for those of you who don't know, Peter Jackson was actually quite trapped, not confused. They, they were unsure whether they should include Sauron at the end, that he would become, he would form you know, his physical form and he would confront Aragorn at the, at, in the Battle of the Black Gate. And this was to happen instead of the troll fight. And for those of you who want to check it out, there's actually a link, not actually a link, you can find the video on YouTube. Just type Sauron versus Aragorn. And you can see some of the sketches and early graphics of, of this battle. Um, luckily, I think they chose to use a troll rather than Sauron. And, I, and it's for the best because it would have taken away the, the main point of the story. The quest was about Frodo, Frodo destroying the One Ring. Aragorn and his fight at the ba Black Gate was crucial. But it was a distraction, you know, so... Having Sauron there, having the main villain of the story suddenly re-embodied and fighting the king that has just rec reclaimed his kingdom would shift the focus away from where it should be. And I think Peter Jackson did an a good job at choosing to forego this choice because it wouldn't have captured the heart of the story. What, and, and that's what made the movies great. They captured the heart and the spirit of the books. You know, there are so many points which... They're, they're emotionally, they hit you, you know, that no matter how many times you see them, like one of my favorite parts, which, again, as you, as you get older, you just start to appreciate them more. When um, Sam and Frodo are in Osgiliath, Oz and Sam gives a speech, you know, why, why, what's, why, do, why does good keep fighting when the world is in, in so much trouble? And it's, it's inspiring. It's something people can integrate in their own life. It's, 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 it's a beautiful quote. Yeah, and um, yeah, I think it's it, it's amazing, you know. So yeah, 
wow, okay, <laughs> I went off track. But yeah, the films are amazing. Um, so, let me scroll down a bit. Okay, that's, that's a cool question. So Dark Keck asked me, should Peter Jackson have, let's say, included the scouring of the Shire? So the scouring of the Shire is symbolic in its own way. It's showing that, hey, the Hobbits didn't escape unscathed from all of this, that they had to come home after such a terrible journey, after so many things, and find one thing which probably mattered most to them in a horrible state. But um, it works in the books. It's cool from a, a storyline perspective, appreciating the point that Tolkien wanted to drive, that the Sauron's damage and harm affected everyone. But I don't think yeah, I think it's good that it wasn't included in the movies. Would have had too many, too many endings, and it's extremely anticlimactic. You know, Sauron's defeated. Gan you know, Hobbits are safe. You know, Gondor is. Aragorn's king, you know, everything's going well. Oh, we arrived in the Shire. Now there's Saruman. Oh, you know, it's it's not it's too anticlimactic. It wouldn't have worked in the movies. Um guys, I'm gonna have to have a drink. <laughs> One second, sorry. <clears throat> so Joseph Italiano asked, why didn't Gimli know Moria was in ruin? Um, so, okay. So Moria was reclaimed, just to give the background info. So Moria was reclaimed when Balin led an expedition from the Iron Hills to Moria. And they, temp they things were going well. They were sending messages back to the Iron Hills, you know, saying they found Moria, where... Balin is king, gold, treasures, stuff is going well. And then all of a sudden the messages stopped and they had no idea what happened. You know, maybe some, maybe they just stopped sending messages. Maybe the messages were getting intercepted. But there was n not really nothing to indicate. But I can see why they, he wouldn't have thought, you know, that the kingdom fell. You know, maybe I would have imagined one messenger would have managed to escape from the kingdom and bring a message back to the dwarfs of the Iron Hills, about the plight of their people. <clears throat> so yeah, I think that's why Gimli didn't know about it. You know, we had the Watcher on the west entrance, the, waters, the water had risen, the Watcher was back in the west entrance, orcs had entered through the eastern gate of Moria, and the dwarfs had no way of, of sending messages to their brethren at that point. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. He... I wouldn't say you should have suspected it. Again, it's, it's a plausible thing to consider, and they were worried about it. They actually mentioned it in the council. Why did Balin stop sending messages? But um, compared to what they faced on Caradras, the mountain was, was going to defeat them. The gap of Rohan was too risky. They would have passed next to Saruman's area. So realistically, there was not much choice in, in, in case of Moria. Um... Hmm. So, let me just read through. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's that's. So why why did Sauron create a ring and not something more difficult to get to, like Underwear? I think Sauron had some pride in his creations and what he would. <laughs> Put his power into but maybe maybe he would have survived the thunder i i don't know <laughs> no, no, yeah <laughs> um so let's see hmm that's a cool question so michael savage asked did morgoth befriend or know of the nameless things hmm Okay, so this is actually an interesting question. So the nameless things, we have to see, were they created through the music of the Ainur, or could they have been perhaps like an, an enigma like Ungoliant, who might have originated from the void above Arda? So if they were from the void, I guess there would be a chance they didn't know 
of the of the he didn't know of the nameless creatures, but I think it's more likely that the the nameless things were a product of the music of the Ainur, but a part of the discord that arose between Morgoth and the rest of them, like an unforeseen creation. So I I would say he would act he would know of them now whether Saruman knew of it is questionable, but I would say Morgoth. My, it's possible that he knew of their existence. <clears throat> so anonymous regarding how long I, I plan to stream, I, I have no idea. Again, I thought I thought an hour. I had no idea an hour passed. Like if you told me how much time passed, I would say it's like twenty five minutes. <laughs> it's two in the morning over here. So, but, but we're going strong, you know. I can't. I'm not feeling tired, and, and maybe we'll cut. We'll end in like what ten minutes. I don't know. For those of you who have been from the start, I really appreciate it. It's awesome and it's really cool of you all. And I hope you enjoyed it. Um, so, so James Broadbridge asked, Do you think that the Lord of the Rings was influenced by Tolkien's experiences in the First World War? I believe he claims it wasn't. Is that the case? I don't think he... So, if Tolkien... I, I'm not, I, I never came across Tolkien saying... That he wasn't inspired by it. Perhaps he said they weren't direct metaphors, you know, to, to include in his works, but I think there are certain inspirations. I, I think again, I had watched this in um, one of the extended editions of The Lord of the Rings, part of the extra features, and they mentioned that in one of the talk in the first editions of Tolkien's books, I think in the fall of Gondolin, there's actually a creature or a thing which looks a bit like a tank moving towards Gondolin, which, which is really cool. And Google it, I guess, because it's, it's a really cool thing to look into. Um, so I would say there were clear inspirations. I would, I'd also think, you know, you have the dead marshes, men being buried, you know, in almost a trench-like atmosphere. I think that's, you know, it's very similar to the, to, the horrors that Tolkien witnessed in the trenches. So there are, there are, and even maybe um, Frodo's PTSD after, you know, that all the damage and harm that he, he sustained throughout the quest came to bite him after, after everything. You know, it's like, I would say for sure, there are clear inspirations. And it's, it's, it's something nice to have in his works. You know, it's like we're experiencing a person's memories or experiences or troubles through, through his writings. Even if it's in a different, you know, format or story mode, it's it's cool. Um, so regarding how old I am, I'm, I'm 26, and I got into the Lord of the Rings um, for a bit when I was like seven years old. My uncle used to read the books to me. Um, show, it's Showtime asked me, do you think the Ringwraiths and the Fellowship attack the Hobbits for their bacon? If you never tasted Hobbit bacon, I don't think it's something to, to underestimate. That's that's a very plausible plausible reason, I'm sure. It's 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 amazing. It's probably like the best thing you could take. I wouldn't blame the Ring Greats if that was one of the reasons to rush the attack. Hmm. So Don Drapper asked, why didn't Frodo ride the eagle over Mount Doom and just drop the ring in the volcano? Or why couldn't the eagle carry him there? So, um, this is actually, you know, something people use often to try and not really mock, but find maybe plot holes in the Lord of the Rings. And I don't really think it's, it's a plot hole. It's, there's actually quite a valid reason, I would say. And um, so the whole point of their quest was secrecy. And if an eagle tried to enter Sauron's lands, let's say it was shot down, or if it was seen by, the, by some of, you know, the orc... Um, what the orc watch watchers yeah um they would have been intercepted by the flying nazgul and the quest would have been you know it would have failed in such a silly manner so um i think there are very it, both of those are valid reasons why it would not occur um they still kind of went on a gamble you know trying to infiltrate mordor and there was only a slight chance of victory Probably it was more than using the eagles. Um, so let's see. 
So, Matthias, regarding the Battle for Middle Earth franchise, they're my favorite games. I've actually been talking to my brother a couple of days ago to actually um, play them over Game Ranger or something. Because I used to play them so much. They're such incredible games. And hopefully, I'll organize some tournaments in our own community. We can, you know, do a knockout tournament. I'll, I'll take part in it for sure. And um, <laughs> it'll be such a cool thing to do. But they're amazing, amazing games. One of my favorite Lord of the Rings ones. Uh, let's go down. So, uh -huh. so Mekhatriya Muhammad asked, what is the story behind Tranduil's face when he spoke to, to Torn about the dragon? Um, this is just an invention from the Hobbit movies. Nothing was wrong with his face. He... He never mentions wars with dragons. They never, they never really even had a war. The war between the dragons was more between um, the dwarfs and the dragons, the the cold drakes of Frodoith. So that's just an invention from the Hobbit movies. He was fine. It looked cool, you know for sure, but yeah, it's just an invention from the movies. Uh huh. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, Ro Rowan McGough asked regarding Transwell's life, whether it's different Hobbit movies and the, and the Hobbit books. Massive difference. I That's actually one of the things I'd love to mention in my series on the Hobbit, Hobbit films, that um, they, they treated Transwell's character horribly. They turned him into... <laughs> he's not the nice guy, you know? He's, he's, he's a bit of a... I'm trying to find a polite word, <laughs> you know? But I think you can guess what I'm trying to say. He wasn't a nice guy, you know? He, he was a bit mean. Not not a nice good not a nice dude, and you know they made him proud, arrogant. Well, in the, well, in the movies he was still a good natured guy. He was you know, an elf after all, so um, I think the the movies didn't do him justice. It added for drama, but for any Tranduil fans, I would maybe better without it. Um, let's see. Guys, there's so much Battle from Middle Earth questions. I guarantee I'm gonna make sure this happens soon. I'm surprised so many people still remember it. So, and for those of you who haven't heard of it, check it out. The EA Games lost the license to it, so that you can actually play it for free now. There's a website, I think they're called um, Third Age something. I'm not sure. But you can download the game from there, it's free. And it's a way to play it on the, on the net. Just check it out, maybe, you know get good at it, and even if you're bad, at, bad, you just join our tournaments and let's have some super Lord of the Rings fun together. Um, let's see. Let's see. So Vicky Lucas asked, did you appreciate the way that the Hobbit movies try to incorporate some of the Silmarillion in the films? Um, I, I don't know if I missed it, but which part are you referring to, Vicky? If you could clarify, I'd love to talk about it. Uh huh. Enraji, regarding the place I'd love to live, the, I'd want to live the most. Oh, okay. Assuming it's not attacked or anything. Hmm. And assuming I wasn't an elf, because I'd rather be, you know, the race of men. I, I think Rivendell is a pretty epic place. You know, it's. You're among the Noldor, you know, the guys that came from the the Undying Lands. You know, the, okay, their descendants. It's, it's, it's just so cool. I, I think Rivendell, for sure. Justin Jones, thanks for the super sub. Um, so your question was, what do you think would have happened? Turn, wait a second. One second. <laughs> Justin, if you could clarify the question, because I didn't quite get it, but if you could clarify it, I'd, I'd totally love to answer it. Let me just try one more thing. Yeah, if you can, just, on, just rewrite the question just to maybe clarify it a bit. Um, so the Mirko Death, you know, my favorite race is dwarfs. I would say dwarfs. 
you know, they're, they're that unique characteristic, followed by men, elves. I like some elves in particular, but they're too perfect. You know, I like conflicted characters. Um, so, Safender, that's quite a nice question. Um, why are hobbits not greatly empowered by the One Ring like other races? So, the ring gave power depending on the inert power of its user and also what its user would want to use it for. So the hobbits didn't have, you know, formidable strength or power. They had really good willpower, willpower, but not, you know, strength um, or magical power. So, and and when we see Frodo and Sam use it, it's more to sneak around, you know, so it would enhance their hearing to be able to hear enemies, you know, just, just help them survive. What's also quite interesting to mention, at one point Gandalf tells Frodo that through learning and lots of time, he would be able to use the One Ring to dominate the Nazgul and to control them to a certain degree. So they still had power. They could still, you know, eventually go strong with it. But inertly, they would have been weaker than the other races. <clears throat> Um, no problem at all, Lore Master. Again, I really appreciate, especially like, sorry guys, I'm going to go off track, but something I really love about this community and which we've really managed to sustain, that even at, what, like 129k subs, I recognize so many names from the comments. You know, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's like, um, yeah, it, it's nice not losing it. I, I don't. I don't want my channel to grow like an in-person experience. I don't want it to be a service, I, or an entertainment. I want it. It's a community. And again, there are so many names I recognize. You know, like Vicky Lucas is participates so much on our Facebook page, or the Lore Master from our comments. There, there are so many people. Again, I. It's 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 awesome. Even Bringarn, trust me, there. It's it's super, and I'm I'm really grateful to still keep that and. There's no chance we're losing it, you know? It's something crucial to this channel. The heart of my channel is this community, and it's you guys. And um, we're keeping it, you know? It's, it's my top priority for sure. Um, so X asked, what's your favorite video game? And do you use Steam? So I do use Steam, but um, I don't play much anymore. Like, it's more... I don't play, play. When I was younger, I used to play loads. You know, I used, when you're with friends, everyone's playing Call of Duty, Left 4 Dead, Counter Strike, Dota, all these like team players. Now it's more single player games, story games. I like I like really difficult ones. You know, like um, Dark Souls, Bloodborne, Sekiro, um, Hollow Knight, uh, or story games. There's um, Divinity was an amazing game. God of War. You know, just just anything that way, you know, those are, give me a, a good story game with a, a decent amount of, The Witcher 3 was super, just anything like that's amazing for me. Um, so, oh, okay, Justin, okay, so Justin Jones asked, what if Saruman turned back to the light? Could we have seen him take his forces and Rohan, take his, and Rohan to join with Gondor? That's a really cool question. Because actually when Gal Gandalf confronts him in Isengard, for a moment, um, he, tells he tells Saruman, you know, come down from your tower, give up your staff, give up the keys of Isengard, and parley. You know, you might have a chance to do good. And... Saruman seems to waver for a moment. He considers it. It's something which I think deep down he knew was the wiser choice. But I, I imagine because of his pride and his jealousy towards Gandalf, he wasn't ready, you know, to swallow his pride. At that point he said, hey, I'm in this. If I'm going down, I'm going down. I'm not going to grovel towards Gandalf. But if he had joined them, I think he would have... Um, for sure he would have used his counsel and his knowledge of, Sar of Sauron to help them. What I would be uncertain of is if he would have joined in the battle for Rohan and Gondor, which I joined, you know, Gondor, 
I think it's almost more plausible that he would have been sent to help with the war in the north, you know, with the with the attacks of um, Lothlorien and um, Mirkwood upon Dol Guldur, perhaps even, you know, the dwarfs of Erebor. I think he, he would have helped more in the northern factions rather than the southern ones. But that's, a, again, it's a really nice question, Justin. I think it would be a, an amazing what-if scenario. I'll actually add it to my list after this video. Um... Let's see. Oh, sorry. I think I missed. Dalton, thanks for <laughs> thanks for the super sub and yeah, rush for rush B. <laughs> um, so, so Rudbar asked, why did the ring rates wear clothes if no one could see them? Their power. So, so this is a cool question because their power of fear was actually stronger when they were. As weird as it sounds, while well, they were naked, <laughs> but um, yeah, clothes allowed them to, you know, deal with people. Part of their, they couldn't see well. The Nazgul were quite blind, especially during the daylight, and they relied a lot on servants, on men, whom they could terrify a bit, and who would serve them, bring them information, these spies. And by retaining a visible form, it allowed them to extract more of this information to. You know, interrogate some of the hobbits in their shire, in the shire when they were looking for um, Frodo. So yeah, it, it was necessary. So again, I've, I've seen quite a few questions asking where I'm from. So I let them collect and just hit it at one go. So I'm from Walter, guys. Those of you who know where it is, great job at geography. Those of you who don't, no, no offense taken. It's totally fine. Um, so. So William Bryson asked, and again, just, just, it's really cool seeing the same names asking really cool questions. I appreciate it. You know, they're really engaging and I like having to think on them, you know, ponder. It's not something straightforward. And I'd be like, hey, you know, these are pretty cool video questions. So William Bryson asked me, if the dwarves were given the rings of power, no, if the dwarves were given the rings of power were corrupted like the Nazgul, do you believe they would have been more powerful slash useful than the Nine? Or even one of them being named Witch King instead? So, um, the dwarves were naturally very resilient. And um, the rings of the dwarves and the rings of men were the same type of rings. They just um, functioned... Not functioned, they, had, they functioned in the same way. But since dwarves were, were resilient... It only made them, you know, want gold more and also, you know, get more gold. But if somehow they lost this result, so no, it doesn't make sense. So, so yeah, they wouldn't be as powerful as the Nazgul. They were limited, limited and also empowered by that resilience they had towards magic. And I don't think it would have been named the Witch King because um, the Witch King was a sorcerer king in his past life. And we don't really see sorcerer dwarfs. Magic isn't really their forte when it comes to spellcraft and normal spells. Perhaps they integrated some in crafting, but I, not in fights. So, yeah, I can't see one of them being the Witch King. Um, so what Showtime asked me regarding the Witcher books, if I'd ever choose to delve into them. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've never read the, the Witcher books. I've only played the game. And there are really good creators that do it already. Maybe I'll cover it one day, but I'd rather cover it. Again, my priorities is more Lord of the Rings. I'm working actually on a second channel with a friend of mine, though I'll be doing the notes and uh, the research while he'll be narrating and doing the editing. Um, he'll actually be, be, be appearing on some future podcasts. In the, sorry, he'll, he'll be appearing in future podcasts because he, he's very knowledgeable about, about Lord of the Rings, very passionate, and he has a super voice, like amazing. So, yeah, the second channel will be about um, mythology. And after that, if I ever find time, I'd, I'd like to create some extra lore on this channel, Geek Zone, which isn't Lord of the Rings related, but I don't want it, want it to take the time I, I use for Lord of the Rings. It would be more like extra videos. On, for example, Hollow Knight, which has has a, has a really beautiful story. Um, 
So, let's see. The war, I, no, I don't play World of Warcraft. So, so who would win between Gandalf or the Witch King? Um, I think, especially after Gandalf returned as Gandalf the White, it's hand down, hands down Gandalf. Even though, you know, the movies portray that duel, the Witch King breaking his staff, that's all just an invention of the, the movies. They were close to fighting in the books, but Rohan arrived before they could actually, you know, do anything. Um, so, let's see. Sorry guys, I'm just going to some of the questions. Oh, this is a cool one. So Drenny Y asked, have you ever thought about writing your own story? I always get very inspired. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, of course, I think, which is really, again, a really cool trend. Um, people who love Lord of the Rings seem to like to create their own worlds and story. And perhaps it's because, you know, we get inspired by this amazing world of Varda, this super um, creation. It's massive. Everything is linked. And we we'll want to create something like that of our own. And I've actually been working on the same book book kind of since I was 14 or 15 and I've got loads of notes which I've been accumulating over all this time and I'm thinking like loads like pages upon pages and it's all connect connected and it just grows organically you know I get an idea and say hey this is really cool and I'm like wow let me just link it to this past idea so yeah I I'm working on one but not actively it's just ideas accumulating together but eventually I'd love to write something um, so, so New Coca-Cola asked, what is your second favorite fantasy world? And mine is Warhammer. Hmm. So I, I've never gotten into War, okay, no, I've never read the books of Warhammer, but I recently tried those, um, Warhammer Total War, and it's my favorite Total War game. It's so, so cool. I love playing all these different factions with their different agendas. And I started reading up on the wikis, like, randomly. And I like that it's so it's a, it's a much darker story, you know. It's different than Lord of the Rings. It's interesting, but I haven't gotten into it so much. So my second favorite fantasy world would probably be the Warcraft one, just based on you know childhood experiences when I used to play Warcraft three, and I used to read some of the lore of World of Warcraft, even though I never played it. It's quite quite a, quite quite a, an amazing story. Um. So. Let me just check. Guys, since the since the stream has been going on for one hour, 30 minutes, I'm probably going to cut it short. You know, I, I'm, I'm really surprised. So much time has passed and it's been it's been so amazing really talking to you all. Like, trust me, the next stream will be really, really soon. It was an amazing experience. I give it what? A few weeks and I'll make sure to host another one. Um, so, yeah, so I think I'm going to cut it here. Cut it short here. Um, what I would like to ask you before ending the video is some feedback on like how do you think the stream went? Like what would you like to see? Would you prefer if I keep answering questions or pick some topics to discuss? Um, I don't know. Like how did it sound? I just want some like feedback. Did you guys enjoy it? What would you want out of it? It's like. It's it's part of the community, as I said before. I want I want something that involves all of us, something which ticks all the boxes of whatever you guys want, you know? Because as dramatic as it sounds, and um my life part of it has been fulfilled by having all this channel in this community. And because you guys fulfill this channel, you guys are this channel. So let's see how we can make it. An amazing experience for everyone. So yeah, um, let me just see. Oh yeah, sorry, Dalton. Thanks for the super sub. A weekly, <laughs> weekly would would be quite uh, quite hard. I think on my vocal cords, especially, I'd be so. Like I, I think usually um, a normal video, which is surprising, you know, you see like, hey, a ten minutes video. How long could this guy take to record it? But a ten minutes video is probably. Two hours recording 
which is crazy. You know, it's like the first time I'd, I'd be recording, I'd be sure, you know, not, not, no, sorry, not the first time I read out my script alone. I'm like, hey, you know, this is, this is going to flow so well. I'm sure it's going to go so smooth. And then, you know, you come to recording and you're like, okay, did this sound right? Did I pronounce this clearly? Is, the, is there nice emphasis? Could I do it better? And you start doubting yourself, you know, re-record and it ends up dragging on. So I end up with two hours of recording for like a, a 10 minutes video. <laughs> so yeah. Um, hmm. Let me just read, just to get an idea of what you guys would want for the next time. Uh, so Anna, reg regarding the, the reminder, I actually had left one earlier, like a few hours ago, but... Sometimes YouTube doesn't promote the community posts. Maybe I need to find a better way to promote it. Also, what I should have done was share it on Facebook and Twitter, which was my mistake. Okay, let me see. Hmm. Um, so regarding a live shot, Hmm. Again, I'm not really against eventually using like a webcam or something, but I think I'd want to do quite a few streams just to get used to it, you know, get more at ease. Because even today, especially, you know, there are still those like peaks, not really anxiety of stress or whatever, you know, um, <laughs> which is why I'd be a bit breathless almost sometimes. So yeah, once, once I get used to maybe I'll consider it, we'll see. Um, let's see... All right, guys, so I'll wrap it up. Just to summarize, I got the impression that you guys would want, you enjoyed, you know, the question, answering the questions. Seems to have gone good overall, which is amazing. Thank you. I'm so, so happy. And um, I'll try and pick some cool topics for next time, you know, just to have some cool cornerstones to build around. And perhaps then the questions you guys ask could be related to it. <laughs> Thanks again for the super sub. Dalton scolds. Next time we should all go on Lotter on charge behind Boromir. <laughs> That's actually not a bad idea to organize like some sort of Lotter rally where all the Geek Zone community goes on a server. We all make like what low level characters and we try and journey, take the, jour the, the fellowship's journey to Mount Doom. You know, we follow in their steps without dying. Whoever reaches, you know, <laughs> whoever stays alive wins. It'd be a cool idea. I'll try and do it. Um, anyway, you guys, I'm ending the stream. It was really amazing. Like, I hope, I hope you can tell from my tone of voice. I'm, I'm super elated. It was, um, it was, it was a fulfilling, super experience. And I really regret not streaming earlier, you know, like months ago. But yeah, and next time it will be at a much better time. I'll do a poll, see what time is best and everything. And yeah, thanks Vicky for the suggestion of asking viewers to submit questions. Anyway, goodbye guys and, and thanks for joining. See you guys.